Hello, and welcome to the Producers Guild conversation with the creative team behind The White Tiger. We'd like to thank our friends at Netflix for making this event possible. It is my pleasure to introduce our moderator today. PGA member Sarah Green is an Oscar and Emmy nominated producer and is known for working with such writers and directors as Jeff Nichols, Terrence Malick, Julie Taymor, Karen Kusama, John Sales, and Ramin Barani, with whom she made Fahrenheit 451. Fahrenheit was nominated for the Best Television Movie Emmy and won the PGA Award for Best Streamed or Televised Motion Picture. Green was nominated for a Best Picture Oscar for Malick's The Tree of Life, which won the Palme d'Or at the Cannes Film Festival. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, Sarah. Welcome, panelists. And please, Sarah, take it away. Thank you, Kyle. And thanks to the PGA for hosting us. This is, this is exciting. And this is exciting for me in particular because um, I am a filmmaker, but I'm really a fan is what I am. I, uh, I got into movies because I got so excited about um, how they work on so many levels. And when I watched this film, which I've now seen a couple of times, I love it so much. I cannot tell you how much I love this film. I, uh, I love it because it hits me everywhere. It hits me. Uh, I love the story. I love the ideas behind it. I love the complicated characters. I love the acting. I love the sound design. I love the music. I love the look of it. It's just the editing. It's, it's, it's just a tour de force. And I want to congratulate you all. It's just a beautiful piece of work. And I'm telling everyone I know about it. Um, so I get to introduce you all, which is kind of exciting and a bit intimidating. Um, I'm going to start with Ramin because I know you. Um, this is director, writer, and producer Ramin Barani. He has made some of my favorite films, including Man Push Cart, which won the Fapressi Prize at the London Film Festival, Chop Shop, which was nominated for three Film Independent Spirit Awards, Goodbye Solo, which won the Fapressi Prize at the Venice Film Festival, 99 Homes, which won the Grand Special Prize at Dovio and a Golden Globe nomination for actor Michael Shannon, many others, and a personal favorite, Fahrenheit 451. He's a Guggenheim Fellowship winner. His work is housed in the permanent collection at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. And Roger Ebert named him Director of the Decade in 2010. Thank you, Ramin. Thank you. Um, uh, next, I'm going to introduce uh, Makul Deora. Uh, who is a filmmaker, a musician, and an artist whose work is celebrated worldwide. He has founded two influential music and sound collectives with performances at the World Social Forum, the Tate in London, and TED India. His performance piece, Break, required the audience to sign liability waivers before taking part, given the extremes of emotion involved. And his audiovisual work, The Body Electric, was commissioned to launch the UK Cultural Olympics. Welcome, McCool. Great. Uh, and next, we have executive producer and actor Priyanka Chopra Joan Jonas, uh, who was named one of the most influential people in the world by Time Magazine, one of Forbes' most powerful women, and is the recipient of the Padma Shri, one of India's highest civilian honors. She is a global and UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador, a Global Citizen Ambassador, and founder of the Priyanka Chopra Foundation for Health and Education. She has over 60 films to her credit as an actor and or producer, and will soon be seen in Matrix 4 and the new Robert Rodriguez film, We Can Be Heroes. Welcome, Priyanka. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, and the amazing executive producer, Ava DuVernay. She is a writer, director, producer, and film distributor, winner of the Emmy, BAFTA, Peabody Awards, and an Oscar nominee. Her directing work includes Selma, 13th, a Wrinkle in Time, and When They See Us, and she has created the critically acclaimed TV series, Queen Sugar, The Red Line, and Cherish the Day. She won the Best Director Prize at Sundance for Middle of Nowhere, and her nonprofit film collective, Array, was named one of Fast Company's most innovative companies. Welcome, Ava. And now, last but not least, executive producer, Sarah Bremner who is president of Array Filmworks. She was one of Netflix's first hires on the original film team, where she spent over five years and shepherded such titles such as Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, The Two Popes, Rebecca, Project Power, 
Bright, The Highwaymen, and more. Prior to Netflix, Bremner held executive roles at A&E Studios, Exclusive Media, and Paramount. Welcome, Sarah. So, uh, so this is the this is a just a delight. There's so much to talk about. I'm going to do my best to keep this at a reasonable time. Uh, and I'll start with Ramin again. Um, so I know you and Aravind, uh, who wrote the novel, are very close. Um, and you're dedicated, you know, he dedicates this novel to you. Can you talk about that a little bit, your history with him and, uh, and how you adapted it for the screen? Yeah, sure. Uh, first, Sarah, just thanks for, for being here and doing this. You know, you're an incredible producer and a great friend, and thanks for taking the time with us. Um, Arvind and I have known each other for about 25 years. Uh, we became friends in Columbia University when we were undergraduates. There was a, a gang of us, you know, Indians, Iranians, Lebanese, Syrians, Afghans that kind of found one another. And he and I clicked because we wanted to be, quote, artists. You know, he wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be a filmmaker. And it was the start of a 25 year dialogue about books, movies, ideas. And he always read my scripts and gave notes and heard my all my ideas for movies. And um, I got lucky and started reading The White Tiger about four years before it was published and was just immediately drawn into it. The book if you've had a chance to read it, it just kind of jumps out of your hands as you're trying to hold on to it. It's just propulsive. The themes and ideas are incredible. And you really get drawn into Balram and his journey of a, this poor kid who's talented and smart, but doesn't get a shot at life. And his journey in this, in this movie and book through, through being a servant to becoming a successful entrepreneur and his witty, sarcastic voice, you know, and wanting to capture that. And, um, it took a while to get there. I waited 15 years to get mm -hmm. to that point. Um, I think Arvin called me about, we talk on the phone usually twice a week and he called me maybe three, four years ago and said, what do you think about trying to make the white tiger? And I said, I, I would love to, maybe maybe now's the moment. You know, maybe it could happen now. And I tracked down the, the rights holder, which was the producer in cool Beora in India. And uh, we got on the phone, um, I think, he knew the book probably better than anyone else I had ever spoken to, like word for word. <laughs> um, we kind of shared a vision for it. We seemed to see it in the same way. And, um, I, you know, I got lucky. He, he asked me to come on board and, and we took it off from there. That's amazing. That's amazing. But cool. Talk, talk a little bit about that, if you will. You know, when you found that book and what made you want to do it? I mean, yeah, when, when, when I read the book, when it came out, um, I think I think more than a decade ago, and it just blew my mind. You know, it it made me laugh out loud. It made me cry, um, and and it was just you know so devastating the way it, it showed the class divide. I I had never read something like that, and I just thought, damn, I, I I gotta I gotta make this into a movie. You know, and uh, you know it takes time, and you know it was a long journey. Like Ramin and me always laugh. He, he waited fifteen years, I waited ten years, and <laughs> and we spoke, you know, and we met, and. And it was amazing because you know is the person who the book is dedicated to, and and who makes movies you know about people you know in in, in the margins and everything. And um, we just hit it off straight away. We agreed on on the vision um, that it's an it's an indictment as well as a celebration of humanity. And uh, yeah, here we are. Miracles can happen. Exactly. Can you talk a little bit about um, Ramin's work and what made you sort of know that he was yeah. the guy? Uh, before I spoke to him, uh, I had seen uh, 99 Homes and I had seen Man Pushkart many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. um, like Ramin said, you know, he has all these uh, friends in New York. I studied in England and I, I had a lot of friends, uh, Iranian, Middle Eastern, you know, similar friends. In fact, some of my friends, I think we're going to invest in Man Pushkart so many years ago. And uh, so I knew his work, you know, yeah. um, and, uh, and I knew the book was dedicated to him. So. Uh, you know, when we, when we met the first time, I mean, for me, there was no doubt that it was, it'd be incredible to get Ramin to make the movie. And uh, I mean, he, he's very, he's very kind when he says, I knew the book better than anyone else. But when I met Ramin, I met my match because <laughs> I knew the book better than anyone else, but he had read drafts of the book. So uh, that was just great. I mean, you know, for both of us to just be like, you know, what do you think of this? And what do you think of this? And Balram and and India and, and you know everything and and he had spent a lot of time in Iran as well so 
he you know completely understood the uh, you know the complexities the the cultural differences that that can happen in india uh like in iran um and i think that was very important as well so yeah brilliant well, i'm very glad you found each other that's for sure um uh, Priyanka, maybe you can talk a little bit about coming to this project. Um, what what drew you to it, and and how did you know you wanted to play Pinky? Priyanka, you there? Oh my gosh, I am, but I can hardly hear you, Sarah. Oh dear. Shall uh -oh. I ask you? It's glinching. Ah. Oh, there we go. Okay, I think it's stable. You guys can hear me. Yeah, yeah. we hear you. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, sorry, I didn't hear what you said at all. Oh, I just wanted to ask you how you came to this project, how you found it, how you, um, uh, what re what you responded to in the project, and what made you want to play Pinky Madam. Well, I'd um, like everybody else read the book uh, when it had just come out, and I remember I was in India at the time, and it moved me and provoked me and made me very uncomfortable actually because you know having been raised in a country um you know where i have seen the perplexities of affluence and poverty kind of existing together and in a world where we are very desensitized to what makes us uncomfortable so i remember how i felt about the book and um a couple of years ago i every morning I, you know, get onto Twitter and I'm figuring out what happened in the day and I was reading actually Deadline. Mm -hmm. And it said that um, The White Tiger was being adapted by Ramin Barani, who I knew the book was dedicated to by Netflix. And I just went after it like a, <laughs> you know, dog with a bone. I got my agents to call Netflix. I'm sure Sarah got a call, Andrew got a call. Um, I got them to reach out to Mukul. There was a lot of conversations with him. I met Ramin in Mumbai. I met him in New York. I met him in LA. I auditioned with him three times. And I said, I beg you, let me be a part of this movie because of a couple of reasons. One, um, I really want to be at the helm of telling amazing South Asian stories in Hollywood. We're one fifth of the world's population. And when you think about that representation in global entertainment, um, you don't really see that number being reflected and having had this opportunity now to, you know, produce work in, in America, I really want to be at the helm of attaching support to um, content that I know I can um, probably give support to. And plus, I was in a place as an actor where I really want to, um, wanted to have an immersive experience when I in my work in India, I've had the good fortune of working with incredible directors and played very intense and varied parts. But since I've come to America, I've not really had that opportunity. So I'm actively sort of looking for, um, you know, parts that I can sort of really dig into and, um, you know, sort of um, explore the variety of characters that I can play. And working under Ramin's tutelage, I knew it would be an extremely immersive experience. And I was absolutely right. Um, he's, he's an addiction um, as a director. <laughs> oh, Sarah, I have to interrupt because that's all very kind and, and some of that is true, but she did not chase me down like that. Now, did. We, did, we did have some very international intrigue in our meeting. <laughs> we did meet in three different cities and, and there was some cloak and dagger to all that. <laughs> but it didn't take it wasn't hard to, to get a meeting she i heard she wanted to meet and i'm like of course i want to meet and so we met at her home in uh, mumbai um i also met her mom who is a, a real force i it was funny I, I kept trying to talk to her mom and um the reason was i i saw if i if you don't mind i say priyanka her mom is so um intelligent and a real leader she seemed like uh, someone who was in charge and I started to recognize that in my first meeting with Priyanka that she's, you can tell in, in this conversation, she's funny, she's humble, um, but she's a real leader. She's a leader of, mm -hmm. of forces of people and of ideas and of movements. And I was drawn to that, you know, her, as a producer, she's focused on uh, films that have social relevance in India and in Hollywood and internationally. She's focused on trying to find directors that don't match the norms. They could be women, they could be Iranian people like me that, you know, so it could be, it could be people that want a shot at things and she has an ability to get that done. Um, and that's impressive 
and, and, and I think her and Ava share, share qualities like that. And I think it's maybe why they might be drawn together now. And, um, you know, as an actress, uh, listen, either, either you're right for the party or not. And, and we did an audition. There, was, there weren't many, there was one. We did one audition together. Two, you did a cold read. I wasn't there. I got a tape out of nowhere. Together in a room, we did one read. Me, her, and the cell phone. I played the part of Balram, and it was a scene that um, I had struggled with actresses in the audition room. And she took it in a direction that I wasn't sure of. So I was like, okay, that, that's cool. That, yes, let's try some other things now. And she heard me, but instead of trying something else, she did the same thing more. <laughs> it, but it made the scene work. It made the scene work in a way that had never worked before. And I'm like, her instincts are great for this part. She's, she figured it out. And um, as an actress, she was just a total pleasure to work with because she was dedicated. She had great questions. She had great ideas. She was good at improvisation. Um, her and Raj Kumar Rao are huge movie stars. The character, the actor playing Ashok, the lead actor is a, it's his first time playing the leading role. And her and Raj had no ego. They just invited him into the party like he was their equal, and they nurtured him, and they protected him, and they encouraged him, and. That was just awesome to see and witness. Was Ramin a different kind of director for you, Priyanka, to work with? Was he, had you worked with someone like him before or was he really a unique creature? Um, he's definitely a unique creature. He's a white tiger for sure. But <laughs> um, I mean, in America, yes, I think in the work that I have explored in the States, he's definitely an anomaly. Um, I've had an amazing good fortune of working with incredible filmmakers in India that have pushed me and pushed me to where I don't recognize myself. And um, Ramin kind of did that. He pushed, pushed me into, and I pushed back. And we had this <laughs> amazing sort of, you know, tug of war relationship, which made our like Pinky as a character who's very complex actually, and was ve is very opposite to who I am. Um, being an Indian and understanding the complexity of the vortex of poverty, you know, it was hard for me to sort of be fake woke where, you know, it's convenient and lean into, um, you know, speaking to Balram as if we and him and I are the same people, but actually he doesn't have food to eat. And, you know, I'm complaining about the fact that I live in a basement. So it's, it's those little things that um, I had to really wrap my head around, but working with Ramin, he's, he just had such an amazing sense. Also on set, we, we had such a collaborative effort. Like I remember Sarah and I talking on set about so many different aspects of how to take the scene. Mukul and I would just wrap on about, you know, the, the Indian context of it all. And um, you know, we're telling the story in the English language and we want to make sure that um, it represents India in its, in its truest form in, in, in Arvind's world. Um, so it was such a collaborative effort that it never, you never felt like, you know, it was a solitary journey and that definitely is an anomaly. That's, that's incredible. That was a, that's a great match. Um, Ava, let's talk a little bit about your, your process in this, in this piece. I mean, this, this feels like a very natural fit to me, given your, all your work with social justice and, you know, the really aware projects that you've done. Um, tell us about, you know, when you came in, came on and where you really got to make your mark. My role on the team is to be Ramin's biggest fan and cheerleader. Mm -hmm. um, literally um, was introduced to Ramin's work through Roger Ebert, mm -hmm. um, uh, a, uh, a, a friend of both of ours. And I think the first time we met was at his memorial. Is that right, for me? First time I wasn't. At, yeah, I, I unfortunately there? wasn't there. No. I don't remember the first time I met you in person. I think it was. Um, I think it was for uh, a Q and A for Ninety Nine Homes. Ninety Nine Homes was that? Yeah. We, but introduced to him through um, through Ebert, and um, my favorite film of Ramin is uh, Goodbye Solo, which. I, I don't know why people don't talk about more. Anyway, mm. you know, it, it was introduced to him through the piece that Roger wrote about Ramin being the, the new great American director. And I remember saying, I gotta watch all this guy's stuff. And so the idea that he would be taking on um, a piece of this scale, which I think is if you're a fan of Ramin, you know that at the heart of it, the beating heart of the story is very much, um, you know, 
what he does well, um, uh, but the scope, the architecture around the story is is um, is is a little more splashy. It's bigger, and so I was really interested in seeing um, where he would take that and how he would be able to create balance and imbalance uh, within mm -hmm. the within that. And I mm -hmm. uh, just thought it was brilliantly done. I was introduced to the project by Sarah Brimner. Um, when she was an executive at Netflix and I was wooing her to come to my company, which she mm -hmm. did. We yeah. have her now, sorry, Netflix. And she <laughs> talked about a project that she was willing to kind of walk away from the other projects that she had been working on, but there was one that was so close to her heart um, that she really wanted to see it through and asked, could she bring it into Array? And I was like, I don't know, what is it? And she said, remember on this next film? I was like, oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was just this beautiful symmetry and I was able to come on board, um, I don't know, maybe about, it was maybe like six, six to eight months before it was finished um, and really able to just collaborate as uh, a friend of a filmmaker during the post process, during the, that very tender moments when you are making your way through what the final presentation of the ideas will be. Mm -hmm. And um, that is a vulnerable time. It's an exhilarating time. Um, and it's a puzzle, you know, to put together. And so just uh, appreciated uh, being able to um, be one of the few uh, voices to, um, you know, answer Ramin's calls whenever he called uh, during that process and to continue to shepherd the project through the Netflix machine. Uh, which um, I, I know pretty well. And, uh, and it's been fun to, um, you know, be on the path of sharing this film with the world through that platform, especially for a filmmaker like Ramin, who I feel very strongly more people should know by name and more, mm -hmm. pe more people should know that work. And one of the things that I've benefited from as an independent filmmaker and a filmmaker with a very specific lens is exposure. And so more people will see this film on the first day of its um, debut on Netflix, then we'll have seen all of Remain's films around the world put together. And, and that's just the power of the households uh, that Netflix um, is, is, is in, has infiltrated. It's fantastic. <laughs> so, I looked at the numbers of the trailer when it hit, they were crazy. But that's an exi that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, a spectacular uh, notion that a, that a filmmaker of Remain's weight and, um, and muscularity uh, will now, you know, be known even wider than he is by more people in their own language being translated into all these languages. It's it's thrilling. So um, it was an irresistible uh, project to be a part of, and I'm just uh, so glad that this team welcomed me in later in the game. Yeah, yeah, well, what a what a gift to have to have fresh eyes from someone with your skill set. To totally, Sarah, because I have been admiring Ava's films because of uh, not only because of. Sundance, which is when I first heard about her work, but then of course through Roger, um, through Roger's writing, um, I came to see all her films and then later her, her series and documentaries. Yeah. And when the idea came up that, you know, maybe Ava could see the film, I was like, please, please show her the movie because one, I love her work and I want to know what she thinks. And also it was a very, um, a weird process, um, Ava, which you're entering into production of this weird thing, but hopefully by the time you edit the film, you won't experience what I did, which is you're alone in a room and there's actually no one else around. Like, <laughs> you can't. I, right. to, I think I screened the film very, very early, hyper, like rough cut, twice before the shutdown. And then I didn't watch the movie with another human being that wasn't my girlfriend, Marlise, that you know, Sarah, at all. And I've never seen the movie with an audience. And so being able to have somebody like Ava, who's a filmmaker, um, a writer, a creator, who's distributed movies, who's produced movies, so she can see things from different lenses. And I think we share a, a vision in terms of the kinds of stories we tell. It was so helpful. And I still remember there were a handful of comments you said that I was like, how come I haven't heard that before? And that's a huge, that's a huge note when I'm this late in the process. And better to get that insight at that moment than to hear about it later when, you know, the movie's done and someone emails you, hey, what, what about that? You know, <laughs> so that, that was awesome. And I remember once we were trying to wrap it up and it was getting into the, into the next stage, you know, marketing, looking at marketing materials and, and 
we went through this together, together Sarah. Um, you know, the last two films, the, the distributors were, they're, they seemed to be bigger. It was HBO. And I didn't want to get too involved in, in the marketing. I just assumed they must know everything because it's bigger than my indie films. And I remember a Ava saying, no. Uh, she said something and I'll never forget. And now, I, Ava, I tell my students when I'm teaching and my and the young, I produced two films for these two young directors. One is premiering in Sundance called Lutsu, the small teas uh, American film. I've told them what you told me, which is the job of the filmmaker isn't done until people start watching it. And I saw how bold you were in the comments on some of the marketing material and it gave me the courage that I should say what I think. I should hear the feedback and I might not be right, but at least I should say what I'm feeling and see where that takes me and what other people think. And I had been less vocal on that. So that was a great, a great lesson and a great tool, Ava, thank you. Thank you. That's spectacular. That's spectacular. Well, Sarah, you've been part of this from, from very early on, right? Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because you kind of go from A to Z, I think. Um, at least from, from B to Z, maybe maybe not A. Right. But, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I was just lucky to have this project come across my desk. Like, um, like everyone said, I was an executive at Netflix at the time and on Scott Stuba's team, and we were submitted the book which I knew and had read not long after it had come out. So it had been several years. Um, and it's funny, Priyanka, you said something that, um, that really resonated with me, which is, you know, it had been several years since I'd read the book. So I needed to take another look at it, but I remembered how it had made me feel. That mm. feeling of, um, of really sort of live discomfort, but it's a good thing. You know, that, it, that, that, that there's a sticky feeling that comes from reading The White Tiger that had stuck with me, even though I didn't necessarily remember the specifics. So we took another look at it. Um, and of course, as you know, we were uh, growing in India and really thinking about, um, you know, what sort of bold swings we could take in that direction. And then obviously, when we heard that Ramin had a point of view on the adaptation, it, you know, that's a no brainer. Like Ava said, it's just, you know, that's that how do you not say yes to that? Um, so I have a lot of gratitude also to Netflix, I think, for, um, you know, having uh, lent in to taking the swing. And that that was really from Scott from the very beginning. Um, and so, you know, Ramin and Mukul and I kind of uh, took off on this uh, development process that was incredibly fun. And um, one of the most collaborative experiences I've had as an executive um, that I feel so lucky has continued you know, through, through this panel and beyond. Um, it has been an incre incredible, uh, incredible journey. And, uh, you know, particularly having gone to India to shoot and the, the level of authenticity and specificity that Mukul and Ramin brought to the production um, was an incredible thing to be able to experience. Yeah, no, I think that's true. But cool, I'd love to hear a little bit more about, I'm just, I was such a fan of the music in the movie. And I know um, that you were, integral to a, a good deal of that. And I'd love to hear about that, how that, what that process was and how you influenced it and how you and Renine worked together on, on that as well as your you know, overall process during the actual production. Sure. Well, you know, one of the, I guess one of my contributions to the music would be uh, the, the, the opening song, which is the Jay-Z Punjabi MC you know, remix. Um, we were just, you know, the movie set like the book in 2010. So it was like, what, what song is, was big in India and big in, you know, in the world and in America at that time. And yeah, I used to DJ, so I, I, I know my music pretty well. And there really aren't that many songs that, that were that big at that time because you didn't have the internet. So, you know, hip hop itself hadn't really traveled to India at the time the way it has now. Uh, and other forms of music as well as more classic rock kind of thing. But Ramin and me discussed it and we didn't want, you know, classic rock wouldn't really fit in, in, into this movie, uh, the themes of the journey. movie. A little journey, a little, a little, would have been okay. A little journey, yes, a little, a little rush, a little REO speed wagon, yes. It, and we weren't feeling that. So, so, so we were clear that it was going to be, you know, we love hip hop and, and we knew that. And, and I was just thinking like, I was like, I know I can get this. If I can't get this, nobody, this is my realm, you know, what's the biggest song in India in the world? And we had a lot of discussions about it. 
And then I just came up with this. And I said, I remember I sent it to Ramin and to Michael. And Ramin was like, I love it. And, and, and we knew it just worked, you know what I mean? Because um, mm -hmm. you have the Indian thing, but it's a, it's, it's a big song. The whole world knows it. The whole world hears it. The -na -na -na, and they're like on it. Um, you know, that was one thing. And, you know, it was also uh, hip hop has really exploded in India in the last few years, uh, uh, you know, with people who, you know, for similar background in India as, uh, you know, the African-American pioneers were uh, in the 80s, you know, in, in New York and in, in the Bronx and everywhere. So um, we had a lot of discussions about that as well. And uh, we came up with Divine, who's one of the biggest rappers in India as well. And we spoke about that and how cool it would be to have a collaboration between Divine and, and, and someone, you know, in America, like a real collaboration. And, uh, um, you know, Ramin spoke to them about the lyrics as well. And uh, Divine watched the movie as well, really vibed with it. Um, you know, I think he really understood and connected with Balram, uh, where he's coming from. And, uh, you know, wrote some incredible lyrics about the jungle, because, you know, jungle is, is, is a Hindi word that's, that's in English, you know, like, like bungalow, like some words that, that have been taken back through the colonial, you know, back and forth that happens. Uh, um, so he's made a song about the jungle, you know, the, you know, the, the king of the jungle and what it means to be Well, the jungle. jungle mantra, actually. The jungle mantra, right. exactly. Um, so that was, that, was, uh, that was great. I'm so happy that, that all that happened. And uh, I mean, that was something that, that Ramin and, and me spoke a lot about from the first time we met that, you know, how do we make this into a true collaborative effort, um, you know, uh, with, the, with the crew, with, with the music, with, with everything, you know, what, how, how can we just make sure that, that, that that's seamless? Um, and, 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 and I think it shows in the film uh, uh, how much we've worked on the, the authenticity as well as keeping the story universal, you know? Um, yeah. Very, very effective, I gotta say. I liked it throughout. Um, so I've, I've been thinking, there's so much about this movie that really sticks with me. And I am, you know, scene after scene, moment after moment, I just, I, I, my heart kind of opened, closed, broke, shifted, you know, it just, it really, I found it so extraordinary. And I'm curious about, um, if I know you've, I'm sure you've worked with uh, uh, Raj Kumar before, Priyanka, but had you been aware of uh, uh, Adrash before this or was he new to you? Actually, I'd never worked with uh, Raj before. Uh, oh, you hadn't? He, no, he's an extremely prolific, incredible actor who not only takes on these um, really large mega movies, but also does really beautiful indie um, parts and um, movies, you know. And I was an admirer of him tremendously, but this is the first time we collaborated as actors and we'd been sending each other mutual love for a really long time. You know, mm -hmm. he'd watch my movies, I'd watch his. Um, but no, I didn't know anything about Adarsh. And it's a funny story. I actually came on board as an actor before Raj and Adarsh were caught, um, uh, cast. And Raj was, it was very close to Raj's casting. So Ramin, it was very clear. He was like, you know, Raj Kumar Rao. He had met one or two other people. Um, but when it came to Adarsh, he was still auditioning people and meeting. So I got the tea every day. He was spilling it to me and I was drinking it. I was <laughs> like, all right, who's the next guy? Who's going to be our white tiger? Because, you know, you need that number one to carry the movie. Um, and he always came back to others. He was meeting like some really large names were thrown into the hat. Um, you know, actors from all over the world of Indian descent that had sort of, you know, wanted to play the part, but he just kept coming back to others. And I remember asking him one day again, we used to decompress um, one of the readings that we did at my house. And, you know, I said, what about others is that you keep coming back to him. And he said the first time he came in to do the audition, um, he didn't sit on the chair. He crouched by the floor and he was waiting for me to talk to him. And I hadn't asked him to do anything. He just came in and did that and that made me so uncomfortable and I didn't know how to react and you know at since that time he's just lived as Balram and when Ramin said that after that you you've seen Adarsh's work he comes from you know a middle class family he has had privileges that we all probably did growing up you know went to school and um, had a normal upbringing but 
decided he needed to live Balram's life, experience Balram's life, got a job in a, um, a tea stall, he washed dishes, he picked up loads on, on, you know, he got paid 100 rupees an hour, which is like a dollar and a half for 12 hour day for two weeks. That's how this man prepared for this part. And Ramin caught on to that so early. Um, so Adarsh was always our, our white tiger and he's, I can't wait to see him unleashed at the, on the world. He's gonna do some amazing work. I, I can, I foresee it. He was awesome. I mean, and I, it was funny. I remember he was doing that job. Well, he also lived in a village for two weeks. Um, mm, that too. Honestly, you know, he had gotten a scholarship to the best acting school in India, um, full wow. ride. Um, so he was a trained actor. He had done some supporting roles, but never the lead. I remember I, I um, texted him one time when he was washing the dishes and I said, I need you to come quickly. I, I need to do a callback. We were just like, it was just like one or two small supporting roles left and I, I wanted him to come for the callback. He didn't know what to do because he was working. Um, uh -huh. shopping. So he told the boss, I got to go get some bananas for the, you know, for the um, cafe or whatever. And he just ran off and then he just kept running and running and running and never went back. <laughs> and um, so then he told me the next day, he was wandering around Delhi trying to find another job. And um, two guys on the side of the road were loading steel, big steel bars into a truck. And they just called him over and said, hey, come over here, you, you want some money? And so he started carrying this huge steel into a truck to make some money. And he came the next day with bruises and cuts on his hand. We had to bring the doctor for some um, ointment so he wouldn't get an infection. Then a few days later, McCool, went to this shopping mall, he told me, and he looked out of the corner of his eye, did a double take and he saw Adarsh squatted on his haunches with like 10 other drivers who were waiting for their masters to come out of the shopping mall and realized I better not talk to him, he's researching. He's, he's there anonymously as pretending to be a driver. So he was so invested in it and so inspiring as uh, Priyanka and, and Raj Kamau were Every day on set, I, I found myself inspired by the three of them, you know, never telling them exactly what to do, always asking them to please surprise me, to please do what they want, to try the scene in a different way, to experiment. And it, it really helped, you know. Um, and going to what earlier, what McCool was saying about the authenticity, he, he and I agreed early that, um, and Sarah, Bremner at that time when she was still at Netflix uh, so totally backed us on this that we didn't really want to take a lot of people with us you know I brought Chad my production designer from North Carolina under the condition he couldn't bring anyone that he normally works with not even his art director yeah you know you work with him on the John Jeff film first, yeah and his first film was Goodbye Solo that Ava that you like that was Chad's first film now he's a big designer you know and everyone in the room, all the producers know, asking a production designer to go to another country and bring no one. I knew he'd be down for it. Cause you know, Chad, he's cool. He was like, sure, just let me interview the people there. And I was, we were like, great. The cinematographer came from Italy with a, an AC and a steady cam operator and a DIT because in India, they told us to bring the steady cam operator and DIT. Otherwise we wouldn't have done that either. And then per the DGA, we brought um, a DGA AD. The rest of the crew was all Indian. And that was super important to McCool and I to have an Indian gaffer, an Indian grip, an Indian sound de uh, department head, an Indian costume designer, casting director. So all the rest of the department heads were all Indian and all the crew was Indian. And that was awesome. You know, they're, they're such a huge industry. That, um, they were so good. They helped the authenticity. And, you know, for me, um, it was a unique experience to turn around and everybody looked like me, you know, and that was kind of awesome. That was very different. Yeah. <laughs> How that did was... you prepare yourself? I mean, tell us a little bit about the pre-production process for you. How did you immerse yourself and know that you would tell a story that was, that was true? Well, I think something that um, McCool and I worked on, I think a little bit with Sarah Bremner's help and Andrew Norman um, at Netflix's help, was um, we just had to get the train moving. And Sarah, like you, and, and Ava, like you, I come from indie background. So I know the only way you can get a movie made is you just got to get the train moving. And eventually people get on board, you know? Mm -hmm. So 
I just started talking to McCool. I said, McCool, let's find the location manager. Let's find the production company and let's find a casting director. Let's interview the three or four best ones, you and I. Let's pick the best ones. Let's make a budget for a one month recon trip to India for me. And let's just present all that to Netflix so they have to say yes. <laughs> and it worked. They, they were like, wait, you've already interviewed all these people? You know, and they, they, of course, they have their checks and the references. And they were like, a little by little with Sarah and Andrew's help, they got the, the money to open up the purse and be like, okay, here's money for you to go for a month or two to India to do some location scouting and some casting and research, you know? And um, it's always helpful to have a document or a deck, you know, just yeah. submit, submit yeah. a grid that has some great serious numbers in it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Mm -hmm. Totally. And so I, I went out there, you know, I lived in Iran for three years of my adult life. Um, my dad comes from a village very similar to Balram's. When he saw the film, he kept shouting that this was his life. And, you know, because he didn't, he grew up like that. He didn't have electricity or running water until he was six. And he didn't hug a water buffalo like Balram in the movie. He would hug the donkeys, you know. <laughs> um, so I felt very comfortable when I was there. Um, Arvind, the brilliant author, gave me some good advice. He said, travel by bus and by foot the way a, a servant would try to get out of the air conditioned car and get out there on the street. And it was about 110 degrees. So you would get out in the street for four or five hours until you started to get busy, but you would go through Old Delhi and you would go to the shopping centers like Connaught Place, this big outdoor shopping mall that we shot a nightclub scene in. And you would just go to the, I would go straight to where the drivers were and try to talk, talk to them. You know, you'd do a location scout to a luxury tower and go directly to the garage and try to find the drivers. And you suddenly in a three hour conversation with them, getting the details of their life and how much money they make. And it's the best you can, you know, what they could tell you about who they are. And one, you're realizing how accurate Arvind was. And then two, you're just picking up details, you know? Um, and that was all super informative to, you know, the final, the final draft and, um, you know, to, to Netflix's credit and Sarah and Scott and Tendo and Andrew, once they saw the casting tape for Adarsh, even though they knew we could have cast a star, all of them said yes, very quickly. They just said yes. And that's an awesome group of people to be partnered with that will support you on casting an unknown on a big project when they know that there are stars that want to play the part. And that, that was awesome. Um, yeah, that was a very, very good choice. He, he made me stay with him, and that character was hard to stay with. I remember reading the book, going, "Oof, he is tough." I, I was, and and I was with him every step of the way. Yeah, it was incredible. So that was uh, good on you. They were well, great to work with. I mean, even the writing process was so good because McCool and I talked endlessly. Uh, Azimi, who you know, my partner, French Iranian woman in Paris, who's been my co-writer on most of my films, or, or she's an associate producer on this. O other than those two people, it was Sarah and Andrew. The Sarah's notes on the script were just tremendously helpful. I mean, you know, among the best notes I've ever gotten from from an executive. That you know, instead of fearing them, you're just kind of waiting for them. You know, um, I remember as soon as I heard that. She was going to array. I texted you, Ava. I don't know if you remember. And I said, Oh my God, you got her. You are lucky. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, we I was worried when I found out and I called her up and I was like, What what the hell are we gonna do? Yeah. <laughs> right. You get used to somebody like that. The scheme to keep her on board, basically. <laughs> Genius yeah. move, Sarah, to bring it over to array. <laughs> Well done. Well, we're, we're sort of out of time, but it, you know, is there anything else you want to say to the young producers watching this? And there's going to be a lot of experienced producers too, but I always like to speak to the, to the, to this, to the ones coming up. So if anyone has anything they want to share, everyone's really done a good job of this, but please take your, take your time now. I just like to say uh, that, you know, most uh, films set in India uh, that travel the world uh, aren't made by Indian filmmakers, you know, it's mostly, you know, Western filmmakers. And uh, that, I don't think making a movie like this with all these amazing people, you know, amazing luminaries would be even possible 
for me five years ago and uh, but it's possible now and uh, in no doubt thanks to Netflix for sure I'm so happy that you know I thought of them then and you know I spoke to Ramin about it and then I approached Scott for it and uh, as you heard they were such an incredible partner they had just started in India uh, three years ago when when I spoke to them first it was very nascent but I just felt they'd be the right home for this you know because of their bazillion eyes that they have everywhere um, and I, I just want to say that it's possible you know whether you're Indian or 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 Mexican or Korean or any, anywhere in the world to 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 do something like this today yeah just to not that I'm a producer compared to any of you guys I've just started doing this but um, just to add to what um, Mukul was saying you know Mukul you recognize this book at a time when no one wanted to make it into a movie. So I really wanna, I feel so proud of the fact that, you know, um, you as a producer from India recognize the gem that this book was and, you know, 10 years in um, are at the helm of making this happen and that you and Ramin as a team gave so much credence to the Indian film industry and the, the kind of crew that you brought on. There were so many of the, the crew that I had worked with in my previous movies. And the Indian film industry is one of the largest film, I mean, is the largest producing film industries in the world. We produce about a thousand movies a year in different languages. Um, and there's not enough credit that's given to them. And it was, I felt so grateful and joyous to turn around and see that this was a movie being made in the English language for Netflix um, US, for Netflix globally, but it had a crew and a com almost completely South Asian crew and cast. And um, it's my greatest joy. It really brings tears to my eyes to be able to see the world. Um, you know, watching South Asian stories um, in such a global way. It's, it's, it's such a joy. I just wanted to share that. So if you have a dream, you know, this is the time to make it. With streaming coming in such a big way, there's an audience for every story. Beautiful. I think the one thing that comes across to me um, is for young, young artists is um, your relationships with other artists. When you think of the poignancy and the symmetry and the fact that Ramin is, has directed the film version of this book that his friend wrote, right. he listened, mm. read drafts of, and that that friend just happened to be a world-class filmmaker who makes films that explore the human condition in such a way that like the, th this was meant to be, but it also speaks to the importance of those early relationships. Yes. Um, that when you're just starting out and you're taking those first steps that don't always be looking at the des destination look at the steps and who's around you because those uh that what you're learning there um doesn't only have to stay there you know it can journey with you and i know all of us who've been on this business for any amount of time always look around us to the folks that were there from the beginning but i've rarely heard a story of a filmmaker coming to a book in the way <laughs> that this um, has come to be. And this film um, is with the perfect filmmaker. It was destined to be his film. Um, he uh, was the only one who could have made it. This is a film about freedom, um, what it means, what it costs. And, um, and that's what all of uh, Ramin's work at its core for me explores among many other things. And so just encourage folks to watch this film, share this film, look at the craft and the way it's made, but also there's deep meaning in every layer. And it's all due to the master, as Ebert called him, Mr. Ramin Burani. Thank you Indeed. so much. Thank you. Uh, both of what, everything you guys said was so beautiful. And I, I, I don't know what more to say, but um, there's something in the book that always struck me, which is you, you think the door is locked, but the key is in your hand. And that's something I've always thought is a good mm -hmm. lesson for young filmmakers directors, producers, writers, don't wait for people to open the door. Just go open the door. Go open the door and make the film. As Ava said, try to get the people around you. Who are they? Are they like-minded? Do they inspire you? Grab them and just open the door and go make the movie. I, I mean, Ava, my first movie was $60,000, Man Push Cart. I don't think your first feature cost that much more. And look look where you're sitting now. You know, Now you're helping all these young people with their first films through Array or their second or third films 
So just don't worry about locked doors. Just go open it. The key's in your hand. Go do it. That is beautiful. That is beautiful. I think that's a perfect way to go out. I just want to thank you all so much. The, it's a beautiful movie. It was lovely to talk to you all. And thank you. Thank you, Thank Sarah. you so much, Sarah. Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 Thanks, guys. Good night, Moko. Or good morning. <laughs> good morning. Sorry, good morning. Have your coffee now. <laughs> Bye, everyone. This was such Bye, a joy. Everyone. Such a pleasure. Bye. 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 Bye.